In a recent interview with John Hilton, Technical Director, Bridges for Oricon, we talked about the key factors to consider in developing sustainable bridge development plans, key challenges in bridge construction within the region, and the best and most effective way to use embodied energy. Here's the excerpt of the interview. Uh, John, can you give us a little overview of uh, Oricon and your role in the organization? Uh, yes, uh, pleased to, Darwin. Uh, Oricon is a, a large multidisciplinary um, engineering and planning uh, design consultancy. Um, we uh, have offices in Australia, New Zealand, uh, right throughout Asia, uh, South Africa, uh, through Africa and the Middle East. Uh, one of our bread and butter disciplines is bridge design uh, and bridge project management. Uh, I'm the global leader for uh, Oricon in, in that sphere. Uh, we have uh, bridge design offices in uh, Hong Kong, uh, in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Auckland, Adelaide, Perth, uh, Cape Town, Shwani in South Africa, and, uh, and in the Middle East in Dubai and in Abu Dhabi. Uh, we've got a group of approximately 150 uh, professionals throughout the world uh, involved in various uh, bridge design projects, and we look to, uh, to the future with promise. We look to see, uh, we're looking to see that uh, uh, good growth in a number of regions um, in the next 12 months. Thanks for that. Now let's talk about bridge development. Uh, what are the key factors to consider in developing sustainable bridge development plans? Right. Uh, thanks, Darwin. Uh, to answer that question, we probably first need to consider what we mean by sustainable bridge development. Um, the World Commission on Environment and Development defines sustainable development as development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Now, that's fairly general, and we can break it down a little bit. Um, we can break it down into three parts. We can break it down to social, environmental, and economic, and each of those impinges on bridge design and construction. And if I can go into a little bit of detail, uh, social sustainability refers to the quality of individuals and their communities. So the question to ask here is, does the bridge as constructed effectively fulfil its functional intention? And if it does, it gets a sustainability tick. Uh, the second component is the environmental sustainability which references the management and preservation of uh, the environment, air, water, land, ecosystems, etc. And the relevant question there is, does the bridge as constructed provide unnecessary harm to the environment? And this particularly relates to CO2 emissions and indeed the whole concept of embodied energy. And lastly, economical sustainability refers to the level of prosperity for organisations and individuals. Is the bridge as constructed cost effective over its full life cycle? And we're looking here at not just the original cost of the design, the construction costs, but also looking at the provision for, for example, safe and efficient inspection and maintenance, and indeed uh, demolition when the bridge uh, may eventually become functionally obsolete. So, uh, so there are three of the factors that we need to consider. Uh, within those, we really can't talk about sustainable bridge development without talking about the concept of embodied energy. And we need to uh, consider that really we can't do anything in this day and age without using embodied energy. So the challenge particularly for bridge designers in this context is to make sure it's effective, that designs are efficient on materials and indeed efficient on reducing waste. For example, uh, work done within Oricon in our bridges group indicates that for certainly reinforced concrete structures, uh, higher reinforcement ratios 
videos and less concrete is generally the way to reduce embodied energy uh, and indeed um, make the structure more sustainable. For um, other materials, uh, usually we have found that there is sustainability gains to be made by using higher strength concretes, uh, fly ash concretes, and indeed um, higher strength steels. One factor which is an important factor in reducing embodied energy is um, the use of uh, bituminous surfacing, which is very common in bridge decks. Um, it does assist in the durability of bridges. Um, it does assist in the visibility for motorists in seeing line marking, but it can dominate the total embodied energy contribution to a bridge and I really think um, authorities and specifiers and designers need to consider whether or not they, the bridge really needs uh, the bituminous surfacing. We've found Darwin that the typical values of embodied energy for bridges are in the range of about 5 to 50 gigajoules per square metre of bridge deck and that's a very big range and it indicates that the a potentially big saving to be made uh, without compromising cost. Uh, sustainability with regard to uh, older bridges, I, I can certainly report that sustainability uh, isn't new. Um, the Roman Bridge at Shav in Portugal has uh, lasted almost 2,000 years. It has an exceptionally low embodied energy and provides a uh, valuable function to the community. Right. Thank you so much for that comprehensive response, Jan. John. Uh, now, we've done a lot of bridge projects within the Asian region. What would you consider are the key challenges in bridge construction uh, within this region? Well, okay. Thanks, Stan. Well, good question. Uh, the Asian region does present its own share of challenges and opportunities. Um, it's characterised by rapid urbanisation, which is unprecedented in the region, in our experience. This is coupled with a strong population growth, and together this has put a real strain on transport infrastructure. The demand for new roads, highways, rail lines, and of course bridges is strong and indeed increasing. Um, Oricon is a large consulting business in the region, as I've noted, and competition is strong. We as a company need to be very selective about the opportunities we pursue. Um, those opportunities sometimes come through the aid market, um, such as World Bank, Asia Development Bank, Offsaid and JICA. And that aid, mercifully, I might add, continued right through the uh, global financial crisis. I, I could also say that in our experience, Asia as a whole emerged through the GFC and talking about the GFC much better than most countries. Um, <clears throat> and I look to the very recent BIS Shrapnel Five Year Ahead report, <clears throat> which only really came out this week. Uh, which notes that growth rates in Asia should be higher in 2013 <coughs> and that construction activities in most Asian countries will remain on a solid growth path and at least at a relatively high level over the next five years. So all these are good signs for companies such as Oricon uh, working in the region. For bridge and construction, design and construction, uh, there are, as I said, a number of opportunities. Um, there is also, uh, Darwin, a growing need for the design of these bridges to be undertaken locally. And from Oricon's perspective, this means doing the work in our established offices in the region. We believe that only by undertaking the designs uh, in the region can the local offices and the, the local issues be fully understood and addressed. So how is Southeast Asia and Asia generally uh, placed economically moving forward? Uh, well, Asia and the Pacific survived the financial shock of the GFC, in fact, much better than uh, many developing nations throughout the world, largely, we think, because 
because of the risk management measures that were put in place uh, following the 1997 Asian crisis. On recent data, it looks like developed countries are running at around 2 to 3 per cent economic growth rate. Compare this with the Asia Pacific developing countries, which are around 8 per cent, and even if we deduct China and India from that, the growth rate is still very strong at around 5 to 6 per cent. share some bridge design philosophies to achieve safety, serviceability, and constructability? Right, okay. Uh, yes, I can. Uh, first of all, let's talk about safety. Safety in design overrides any other consideration. To be effective, safety must be formalized, and it's usually formalized with procedures so that it effectively becomes part of the conventional design process. And there are sound reasons for this. UK research indicates that 36% of deaths in the construction and building industry can be traced back to a design factor. A study of construction related incidents in Australia shows that for over half the fatalities reported in the survey period, at least one design factor contributed. In Oricon, the safety and design process is also formalised in workshops. To be most effective, it needs to be undertaken with input from both the design and construction personnel, and indeed carried out to some extent before the concept design is locked in, again before the completion of the final design, and also when significant changes occur to either the design or construction methodology. I can quote a recent example where we've followed this through, which is the work on the upgrade to the Sydney Harbour Bridge in Australia. Uh, work on this major Sydney icon was completed by Ballstown, who is uh, one of the uh, top bridge contractors in the region. Oricon was the designer for both the permanent works and the temporary works. The project involved intricate work on key components of the bridge. Uh, it was done through an alliance delivery method that included um, the New South Wales Roads and Traffic Authority, Ballstown, as I mentioned, Fraser and Australia, and Oricon. Work was successfully undertaken over, around, and under one of the most complex operating environments in Australia. Sydney Harbour Bridge is one of the busiest roads in Australia, in addition to supporting a twin track electrified rail line, a cycleway and a footway. The upgrade works were unique, technically demanding, requiring exacting tolerances and on a scale never previously undertaken in Australia, we believe. In response to these significant challenges, we developed groundbreaking solutions among the many hallmarks of the project included a truly integrated team, evidenced by the quality of relationships that it led to, a unique approach to safety, an uncompromising approach to quality commensurate with a heritage listed global icon, and innovative solutions developed and implemented in an extremely constrained environment. This work was recognised by major excellence awards from both WorkCover and Consult Australia. Thanks, John. Uh, now, uh, as my final question, this has been a very insightful uh, conversation that we're having so far. But for my final question, can you share some key successful bridge projects that you had at Oricon uh, recently? What are the main reasons behind these successes? Right. Okay. The main reasons behind successful projects, I reckon, uh, comes down to uh, a few 
very important dot points. Uh, from our experience, successful projects really contain the following features, Darwin. A committed team, which is focused on, on one goal. A task oriented management structure, where people have very clear responsibilities. An open, honest reporting system, um, both formally and informally, uh, in the design. A strong respect for others uh, in all aspects of the project team. And just having good people with the ability to seek and provide assistance regularly. Um, certainly successful projects are produced by successful teams and I've been fortunate myself to work with some great people both within Oricon but also amongst some of our key clients, our contractor partners and indeed our fellow consultants. I'll be seeing some of these people at, at our upcoming conference in Hong Kong early next year, darling, and I'll certainly be looking forward to it.